promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hello and welcome wrestling fans to another retro review right here on Cheap Shot Entertainment. We're continuing our journey through the year 2003 and that brings us to the show following Insurrection in, in, in Newcastle and it is a Raw exclusive pay-per-view with a triple main event including the Redneck Triathlon and if you've never seen a Redneck Triathlon you're not missing very much but it's still funny anyway it also features Goldberg and Chris Jericho and Triple H versus Kevin Nash inside a Hell in a Cell so this is coming to you from the Compact Centre uh, or the summit, as it may be known now, in Houston, Texas, on the 15th of June 2003. It is a raw brand pay per view as the brand split was completely done and they had separate pay per views apart from the big four. So that was pretty cool. And the attendance, according to JR and the King, was over 10,000, but we have an official attendance of around. 10,000 uh, for this one. So, like I say, it's a Raw only pay per view. Uh, the theme song is Headstrong by Tapped, and the game appears in WWE 2K15 and SmackDown Here Comes the Pain. So, before we head off into the main part of the podcast, please do like and subscribe on whichever channel you are watching this on whether it's the podcasting channel or the YouTube channel, that helps us out loads and really does let us know that you appreciate what we are doing here at Cheap Shot Entertainment. So without further ado, let's move on to that main part of the podcast where I start talking about the actual wrestling part. And I use the word wrestling very loosely because of the Redneck Triathlon. Before the main pay-per-view, there was a Sunday night heat. And the match on that Sunday night heat was Ivory versus Molly Holly. Now, without going back to that particular Sunday night heat, and I'm pretty sure it is on the network, I will just read you the result for that one. And Ivory defeated Molly Holly. I'm guessing she was Mighty Molly, maybe, at this point. I'm not sure. I think she probably was. Um, <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. I liked Mighty Molly. I liked Molly Holly in general. She was very good. But we go on now to the main pay-per-view. And the first match, which is a tag team match between Rodney Mack and Christopher Nowinski with Teddy Long. And they are going up against the Dudley Boys. And the Mac Militant is it would be in their song, did get inside Devon's head, asking the question, why is your white brother always telling you to get the tables? A question that we'll never get the answer to because no one really cares. All they wanted him to do is get the tables because that was cool. And became a massive thing in WWE. I mean, huge. To the point where it was on T-shirts and stuff. Um, but this match, actually, is is pretty decent, actually. For, for an opener, everyone's got to, you know, someone's got to do an opener. And I've been in the position where I've been part of an opening match. I've been in a main event match. And, um, you know, a first half main event match. And each of those matches do need time. They do need their place and they have their place. And it absolutely has this has its place. This tag team match is very good. It's very well worked. Christopher Nowinski is 
uh, obviously very new to this and you can tell because I, I recognize stuff that I do when I'm in in a match that Christopher Nowinski is doing not quite sure what to do next a bit not vicious enough sort of thing um, but overall you know Devon Bubba Ray they talk him through it and, and Rodney Mack does as well as well as Teddy Long who's been in the business for a long time at this point starting out as a referee and I would say to any trainee in wrestling that to you know show that you are adaptable if someone asks you to do something pull on the stripes or whatever then do it doesn't mean you're going to get put in a box it just means that you're willing to do stuff for people that need stuff doing a lot of my bookings and going off on a tangent here a lot of my bookings are not what I train to do but I actually really enjoy those bookings now and I enjoy what I do on those shows so it is a case of being adaptable if you're not adaptable you're probably less likely to get booked if you're training to be a wrestler so you know that time will come and you have to bear with it and grit so much like NXT, back in the day, they had to grit all the way through the series because it was an MTV series, so it was episodic and there was things going down and everyone got voted off and it was very 2000, uh, early 2000s TV. So anyway, with that, um, you know, Christopher Winsky, he does, he does a good job. They, they, The commentary team do a really good job of hamming him up as well because... They always say how he captained the Harvard football team. He's got a bigger IQ. He's got the biggest IQ in the whole of uh, WWE. And and King's quips say you'd have to stand on a chair to raise your IQ, that kind of thing. Very dad jokes, but they're funny. So I can deal with that. But the match itself, yeah, you've got uh, Bubba Ray Devon really sort of taking out Christopher Nowinski taking out the frustration on him. Roddy Mack doesn't appear very often, but there is a lot of distraction and you know clubbing from behind. There's an early pin which gets broken up by Roddy Mack uh, from Bubba Ray onto Christopher Nowinski. Uh, they do hit the what's up, but as Bubba Ray tells Devon to get the tables, Teddy Long jumps on the side of the ring and says, what's up, player? Why are you letting the white man tell you to get the tables? He thinks about it. He does go for Teddy Long. Teddy Long ducks out of the way. It's at this point that Rodney Mack takes out Devon, and this leads uh, Bubba Ray to take out Rodney Mack. And whilst all that confusion is happening, Nick Patrick, the referee for this match, is distracted, and Nowinski comes in with his metal face mask, which he does take off halfway through um, with his metal face mask and hits Bubba Ray Dudley in the face for the one, two, three. Um, I really like this match. I thought it was a great opener. I'm going to give it three and a half cheap shots out of five and very, very well worth it. It was two. Now, I don't know whether to class this as a... A match, it's not really a match, um, but it is the redneck triathlon. So I'm going to go ahead and not give these parts a rating um, just because they're not wrestling matches. So um, the first, so the big package here um, showing you how the redneck triathlon came about. And it is, you know, they... they, they Spin the wheel and find out the first match is a Poontain Pie eating match because that was all the rage back in 2003. And the the second match, which actually happens to be the first match which we're going to talk about, say the first match, first contest, which I'm going to talk about now, is the burping contest. You know, redneck triathlons. Of course, you have to have a burping contest. I was hoping they were going to have a demolition derby because Crush Hour came out around about this time and it would have been a great advertisement for it, but burping contests, it is. 
So Terry gets the job of judging the burping contest. Eric Bischoff goes first, has a burp. Uh, Stone Cold does a deeper burp after eating two hot dogs and drinking a beer. Eric Bischoff goes again. And at this point, you can really tell that they're piping in the burp noises. Uh, yeah. Um, Stone Cold has another beer, gets himself ready, goes again. Eric Bischoff has the third one. Very good indeed. And Stone Cold Steve Austin does a burp that's like a minute long. And yeah, it's pretty stupid, but it's quite entertaining. So Stone Cold wins the first contest of the Regneck Triathlon. He then has a speech that says, I'm really pleased to have won this contest and I'd like the record to show that I appreciate that Eric Bischoff was a very good contender for his crown. Uh, we've potentially got two more rounds of this. Hold on to your horses, people. Next up, we have the match, singles match between Test and Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner for the managerial services of Stacey Keebler. And of course, those managerial services come with perks. And I'm talking about the legs that go all the way up. And uh, yeah, she's still a very good looking woman. Even now, she is absolutely gorgeous. And I am feel I am able to say that because... You know, people need to spread the love. And Stacey Keebler was gorgeous. Um, so, oh, stop saying Stacey Keebler's gorgeous. Just one more time, Stacey Keebler's gorgeous. And uh, we'll talk about the match. So it is, um, like I say, it's Booker T, not Booker T. That is the next match. It is Test. I've lost concentration now. It is Test versus Big Papa Bump, Scott Steiner. Now, Steiner seems to have gotten a... a bit of a fan following here at uh, in in Houston but i guess that might be because they don't really like test and they love stacy keebler so i yeah i don't know what's going off with that but it's getting better you know after such a, a long time off test seems to have brought the best out of scott steiner in his wwe run at this point in time and like i say the winner of this match does get the managerial services of Stacey Keebler. A similar match happened at Insurrection and now we get the payoff. So going straight into the match, Test pulls down Stacey Keebler from the apron after she makes googly eyes at Scott's Diner and uh, they're having an argument on the outside and <laughs> sorry this bit is dead funny. Scott Steiner's attempt to um, <laughs> fly off the apron uh, fails miserably. <laughs> he slips and does a face plant onto the floor. Oh my goodness! It is one of the funniest things I have ever seen in my life. He just like he just goes to take off and he does it. He just goes splat, and oh mate, it's so funny. Um, anyway, they, they they pull it back kind of, and Scott Stein is still on top, no selling the uh, face plant, and uh, they bring it back into the ring. Scott Steiner is. In control for most of this match, uh, it's only Test and his dirty dealings with Stacey Keebler that um, give Scott Steiner the win on this one. After Scott Steiner has a bit of an altercation with Stacey Keebler, um, not Scott Steiner, Test has a bit of an altercation with, with Stacey Keebler. And Scott Steiner goes to hit him, Test moves out of the way, they stop. Test rolls out of the ring. Actually, no, he doesn't at this point. He hits him with a big boot. He hits Scott Steiner with a big boot. Near fall. Test gets annoyed. Rolls out of the ring. Tries to get the chair. Stacey Keebler comes around tries to take the chair off of him. He shoves Stacey Keebler on that well-toned butt of hers. And uh, climbs in the ring. Goes to throw the chair at Scott Steiner. Scott, Scott Steiner moves out. Out of the way, Test ends up hitting himself in a ricochet of the chair off the top rope and into the Steiner flatliner, I think it's called, isn't it? 
um, for the finish. And yeah, Scott Steiner wins. It's a fairly short match, but it gets done everything that you need to do in a particular match. So it it worked. It worked very, very well. And uh, I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five. Scott Steiner wins the match and the managerial services of Stacey Keebler. All the time, the King is saying that he can see it um, because Stacey Keebler is on the shoulders of Scott Steiner. Um, moving on, actually. Yeah, the next segment's not anything different, really. It is the pie-eating contest, and it is Stone Cold Steve Austin and... Eric Bischoff talking about the pie eating contest. Eric Bischoff says that he's been doing some research and takes Stone Cold to a room with four very good looking young ladies. Uh, he says that he's been having some hands on interviews with these young ladies and it's stuff that you wouldn't get away with nowadays at all. But it's 2003. Not not defending it, but that's what it is. It's uh, probably the edgiest it's been since the Attitude Era. But, um, yeah, so they argue over who is going to go first. Stone Cold thinks he should go first. Eric Bischoff thinks that Stone Cold should be a gracious host in his home state of Texas. And let Eric Bischoff go first. Stone Cold agrees, but he says he's going to pick the flavour of pie that Eric Bischoff is going to uh, eat. And <laughs> can't believe I'm explaining this to you. But if you're still with me, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so they shake hands and he says he can't lose. Well, what possible shenanigans could happen later on in the show? Who knows? Next, we have a title match. It is for the Intercontinental Championship. It is the Intercontinental Champion Christian, newly won at, um, what was it? I can't even remember the name of the pay-per-view, but it was won in a battle royal over Booker T, and they've been having a back and forth ever since. Um, it was two pay-per-views ago, in fact. It was the end of uh, May. Is that over the edge? I want to say over the edge. Could have been Backlash. Probably Backlash. Yeah, I think it was. Because um, we've had insurrection in between. So... <clears throat> Yeah, so it is Christian versus Booker T. Uh, Booker T is in his home state of Houston, Texas, so why not? And um, yeah, he uh, gets most of the offense in here, Christian being the typical cowardly heel. Uh, Booker T with some high energy offense, including um, spine busters and, f and, and face busters and... Uh, Lots of other stuff that Book only Booker T can do, including I don't, I don't think he in, included a Spinny Rooney in this one. I don't think he actually got the chance. Christian, of course, being the cowardly heel, he decides that all of this offense he doesn't like it, so he disappears and uh, goes to walk out of the match, trying to get counted out. Of course, with the champion's rules, this means that the champion keeps the title but loses the match. But for the sake of keeping the gold, why not? So Christian attempts to do this. The referee takes the rules into his own hands and says, Actually, you know what? If you don't return to the ring, you're going to be counting out and you're going to lose the championship. So, of course, everyone screams and they go, Yay! And Christian comes back in uh, only to hit Booker T with the championship and get disqualified anyway. Um, it was an okay match. It is not as good as the last couple of matches that we've seen on the card, but it was solid up to the point where Christian obviously cheated to win. But I don't mind that. I don't mind that he did it. And in the way that he did it as well was um, quite cool, actually. You know, like, I'm not going to lose the championship, but I'm okay losing the match by smacking him in the face with a championship. So, um, yeah, a bit of a surprise, this one. Uh, no, I haven't seen this pay-per-view for a long time, but a bit of a surprise that um, Booker T didn't at least get very close to winning the championship. 
um, as close as he's been was that Christian only just beat the count of 10 when he was getting told to get back in the ring. So, yeah, a bit of a surprise, but, you know, I'm, I'm a peep and I'm OK with this. I'm going to give this two and a half cheap shots out of five. So we resume the uh, the pay per view with the second part of the Redneck Triathlon. It is the pie eating contest, and it's taking place in the middle of the ring, literally, and is hosted by the king. He is very excited by all of this, and so are the crowd apparently. And he introduces Eric Bischoff, introduces Stone Cold Steve Austin, and then Austin has a very difficult decision to make because he has to choose what flavour pie Eric Bischoff will be eating at Bad Blood. And uh, he says, you know what? Anyone can have the pretty ones. And brings out the fabulous Moolah and Mae Young. It is... Of course, Mae Young, who is uh, always up for these things, and she's very sorely missed uh, for segments just like this, because this is really hilarious. Disgusting, but hilarious. And um, she's uh, really... Like, they they play this up really well. And she's, like, wandering around, chasing him, touching his ass, and all that kind of stuff. And Eric Bischoff's reaction is so funny. Um, they do eventually kiss and, uh, Eric Bischoff turns around and says, beat that Austin. And says, hold on a second. This is a pie eating contest. You kissed her. Mae Young then kicks Eric Bischoff in the nuts and, uh, he slumps down in the corner. Uh, only for the world's oldest Bronco Buster to uh, happen and uh, Bischoff to uh, eat the pie. Um, <laughs> it's now Stone Cold's turn and he decides to give Mae Young a Stone Cold Stunner. Fair play to her. She is about 80 at this point and she's always was up for things like this. And at 80 years old, if I'm taking a stunner, then I'll be very happy. I won't be bronco busting anybody for them to eat my pie though. So, you know, you can only have half of the uh, goodness there. But, yeah, again, I'm, I can't I can't give this segment. It was funny. I'm not going to give it a rating because it eats up literally. Like, the first hour, a lot of that has been this redneck triathlon thing and... Yeah, it's funny, it's entertaining, and so far the pay-per-view's been pretty decent. So we'll move on from there, because Stone Cold leaves drinking a beer, and we go on to the next match, which is another title match. It is for the Raw Tag Team Championships, the World Tag Team Championships, as they are called. Beautiful title belts they are too, a uh, fleck of red to reflect the fact that they are the Raw Championships. And... Uh, it is Kane and RVD, the champions, going against La Resistance. And uh, we get a little promo package. Kane is having some evil thoughts, no doubt, and uh, didn't come down to save his tag team partner, Rob Van Dam, after he beat Sylvain Rungier and got a beat down. Uh, RVD goes to confront him and Kane just walks away. So are they going to be on the same page in this one? Or are La Resistance going to take the titles back to France? Well, it is, again, a very short match. I can't... It, it served a purpose to forward a story, but you can always use that story to sell a match. And they didn't really sell the match with this one. Um, La Resistance... Is getting beaten down. Uh, both of them head out the ring. Uh, Kane goes to choke slam them both because he's out of the ring as well. And RVD goes for the dive. And of course, La Resistance pull 
Kane in front of the diving Rob Van Dam, only for Rob Van Dam to get thrown back into the ring. The given the au revoir and La Resistance win the championships. Not much to this match at all, which is why I'm going to give this 1.5 cheap shots out of 5. Not a terrible match, like I say, it served a purpose, but it wasn't long enough for me for a tag team match. And um, La Resistance walking away with the championships, I'm okay with that. They were a decent team back in the day, and it just served a purpose for pushing the younger talent, and that's something that's not there very often anymore. So, served its purpose 1.4, 1.5 cheap shots out of five, and uh, we'll move on to the next match. Moving on now to our next match. It is Chris Jericho versus Goldberg. And the story being told here is that they were both in WCW. They were quite good friends. But Chris Jericho got jealous of Goldberg's rise to the top. And uh, that is the basic story here. I mean, uh, Goldberg has been put in... Uh, actually, I don't think he has been put in. No, he has been put in a couple of matches, hasn't he? Answers on a postcard. I cannot remember. That's how memorable this run was. Um, but he would get his chances later on down the line as well. And obviously pick up the championship and whatnot. So, yeah. This match is... Well, it's a match, isn't it? Uh, it's not much to sing home about, really. It's just two guys. Um, and... Chris Jericho <clears throat> playing the heel really well here to Goldberg's face. And Goldberg settles, actually. He he has a different way of doing things in WWE than he did in WCW because he was booked as this mammoth monster who just could not be taken out. But, yeah, he, um, he looked like he was feeling what Chris Jericho was bringing in this match. But, of course, it would end with the combination of a spear and a jackhammer on Chris Jericho for Goldberg to win. Goldberg had his shoulder worked on all the way through the match after missing a spear into the barricade. And that would be the story of this one. But, yeah, he would still be able to pick up Jericho for the jackhammer and the win. And then, obviously, like I say, he was selling the arm which is good because you know if you've got a if you've got an injury, whether it's in wrestling or any other, you you tend to hold on to that injury. I know because I'm going through a, a bit of a comeback myself with a shoulder problem that I've had for a while. So yeah, he um, he did well in this one. I I enjoyed this match for what it was. It wasn't anything to sing home about, like I say, but I'm going to give it two and a half cheap shots out of five. And we move on to the third part now of the Redneck Triathlon, which apparently is a singing contest. But then gets changed halfway through. Where Eric Bischoff comes down to the ring. He starts singing his own music. Stone Cold says, hold on a second. Your lip syncing. And he says, no, I'm not. He says, yeah, you are. And it's, yeah. Anyway, um, Stone Cold comes down, gives Eric Bischoff a, a Stone Cold stunner. And by forfeit, it's now a pig pen match. So, <clears throat> Eric Bischoff gets another stunner. Stone Cold beats him up the ramp and then throws him into the pig pen. I can't help feeling for those poor little piggies because they were really chilled out up to that point where Eric Bischoff got thrown into their pen. Um, but yeah, that is the Redneck Triathlon Stone Cold wins. If I could give this minus cheap shots out of five, I would. But for what it was, it was thoroughly entertaining and and quite, yeah, it was quite 2003. But we move on to actual wrestling now. Two of the all-time greats in The Nature Boy. Woo! Ric Flair and the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels, making his 
come back in some, at SummerSlam 2002 in the unsanctioned street fight with Triple H. Now a full-time wrestler again, which is insane because we've gone right back like 10 years where Shawn Michaels was on top of his gig and so was Ric Flair. And Ric Flair had the best of him built, brought out uh, on this one, I think, because Shawn Michaels is so good, so good at doing, um, doing what he does or did. And now he's obviously giving that, that uh, knowledge to the people down in NXT, which is absolutely awesome in my book. But this match, wow, does it tell a story? Yes. Is it everything you want it to be? Yes. Is it better than the WrestleMania match? No. But it's still a great match by two fantastic performers inside that squared circle. And it starts off by telling the story of who is more cunning, who is who is willing to get to... Uh, you know, who's willing to, to do stuff to, to get the upper hand. And it is obviously Ric Flair that does that. So after a couple of lockups, um, Shawn Michaels doesn't let go in the corner and the referee pulls Shawn Michaels away and the uh, Ric Flair chop lock. Um, of course, he's going to start working the leg from that point because his finisher is the figure four leg lock. And he does eventually get this on only for Shawn Michaels to crawl over to the ropes and break it up. And it would be, uh, yeah, it, it, then from there we get a table spot where Shawn Michaels jumps off the top rope onto Ric Flair. Ric Flair is then cut open at the back and uh, Randy Orton would try and get involved during this spot as well, only to get a super kick down the line. It would then be Randy Orton who would get involved Again, with a devastating chair shot on Shawn Michaels, only for Ric Flair to crawl over and get the pin. Ric Flair wins. A uh, bit of a dumb finish. Uh, I mean, it works because of the people who were involved in it and understanding how it was going to work. But I would have loved to have seen a clean finish with this one because... The two people in the match were so good and it was like a masterclass of wrestling and, and storytelling and just being at the top of your game. So I'm going to give, I'm going to, I want to give this four cheap shots out of five. I'm going to have to knock a, I'm going to have to knock something off because I was enjoying it so much. And then Randy Orton happened, which I'd say is fine. Uh, I'm torn. Now I'm going to keep it at four. I'm going to keep it at four because it was only a short bit that Randy Orton had, and he did get taken out the first time. So, yeah, I'm going to give this four cheap shots out of five. It is a very, very good match, and if you're a wrestler in training, this is a good match to watch because it doesn't get a lot of time. However. They do everything they need to do to get the stuff in, in the time that they're given. And that is, in my book, a masterclass of wrestling. <clears throat> and so we come on to the main event for Bad Blood, which is Triple H, the world heavyweight champion, versus his old friend, Kevin Nash, Big Daddy Cool. And this is not just a normal match because it is in the confines of a hell in a cell. And who else crazy enough to referee this match than none other than Mick Foley, the man that was retired inside a hell in a cell by Triple H, one of the combatants in this match. Wow. Just saying that out loud is just storytelling at its greatest Three years previous, Triple H retired Mick Foley. It wasn't too long before Mick Foley would come back, of course, but, <laughs> um, you know, he only had the odd match here or there, but he got retired by Triple H, and obviously there's some bad blood, literally, between Mick Foley and Triple H, and there's certainly some bad blood between Kevin Nash 
and Triple H. So he finds himself backed into a corner on this one. Uh, it's hard to describe a Hell in a Total match, but you've obviously got the added, I suppose, the added bonus, the added incentive, the drive that this is almost what well, should be used as a feud ender. And uh, I think in this case it was, but I will eat my own words if it's not. But yeah, Kevin Nash is coming into this one with a lot of momentum, a lot of anger towards Triple H. And it shows in the early part of this match as Triple H is getting beaten, battered and bruised from one end of the cage to the other by Kevin Nash. And Triple H doesn't have a lot to come back from on this because he uh, doesn't get much offense in. The cage is used, the cell rather, more cheese grater like um, than the uh, cage. And of course, there's easy access to the cage in this case because the cell is bigger than the ring. And that was the whole point. Uh, there is no rules, obviously, in this match, and uh, that leads to a lot of use of the cell and the surrounding areas, including a sledgehammer, the steel stairs, a chair, and all of the other stuff that goes with it. And of course, Mick Foley likes to get involved with this as well, because Triple H tries to intimidate Mick Foley as a referee and obviously that doesn't work that leads to him getting a mandible claw with Mr. Sucko firmly over the hand of Mick Foley and uh, this also leads Kevin Nash to the finish which is Triple H getting out of that move getting a, a, a kicking out of a powerbomb and uh, narrowly saving his championship only to go outside for Sledgy and using that to take out Kevin Nash for the win. Putting Kevin Nash over hugely here, but also keeping Triple H's title run going. And it's just one of those years where he just goes through the entire WCW roster, uh, or should I say X. WCW roster and uh, defends his title against all comers but this happens to be one of his better matches of 2003 you can't really go wrong with a Hell in a Cell match you've got the added thing of the cell and, and no rules and you've got a special guest referee in there they really did everything they possibly could to make this match good and thusly it was and it was damn near perfect i'm going to give this one four and a half cheap shots out of five because there wasn't a lot wrong with this one but it wasn't quite as good as some of the other hell in a cell matches that i've seen uh, whilst doing these retro reviews and so overall bad blood is a pretty decent pay-per-view actually if you've not seen it if you're new to wrestling or you're a bit, bit younger than 2003 or maybe you were born around that time and didn't get uh, the you know didn't get wrestling until you was a bit older but i'd suggest if you've got the means to do so go back and watch this one bad blood 2003 and uh yeah, really enjoy this one because it is really good uh, from start to finish. The redneck triathlon I could have done without, but in in that case it was none other than entertainment and it added a little bit of something to this show. It didn't take anything away from the matches at all, except um, perhaps there could have been a few more matches instead, but... Yeah, with, with the Hell in a Cell being the main event, you can't really go wrong. And from here, we move on to next month's pay-per-view, which I will be doing another review of. And I will thank you for watching and or listening, uh, mainly listening, because even if you're watching on YouTube, you are actually listening rather than anything else. And uh, yeah, you are the cheap shot nation i have been your host luke and uh, i'll see you 
next time as I'm going to find out. It's Vengeance next. We're coming up to Vengeance. Yeah, there we go. Found it. Vengeance, July 27th. And uh, that took place in the Pepsi Centre. Uh, and it is a Smackdown exclusive. So it's the first Smackdown exclusive pay-per-view we've got. So that's pretty cool. And uh, we'll see you there. Thank you very much for joining us. And goodbye. Hiya!